2004. This is the beginning of an interview with Mr. Eugene Guy. Mr. Guy served in the United States Navy and with the American Red Cross during World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. And he also had assignments in other locations throughout the, the world. This interview is being conducted at the Atlanta History Center. My name is Frederick Wallace, and I am the interviewer. Mr. Guy, as I, as I have explained, this is your story, your opportunity to tell about your experiences in the military and with the Red Cross. I want you to begin by telling us where you were born, where you went to school, when, where, and why you went into the military. And then from that point on, take us step by step through your various careers. This is your story. Would you begin, please, Mr. Guy? Thank you. Thank you. As, as he said, um, my name is Eugene Guy. I was born in Birmingham, Alabama, a little suburb of Birmingham called Vinesville. Uh, I was the fourth of five children, <coughs> had uh, two brothers and uh, two sisters, two brothers older uh, and one sister older and one sister younger than I. We uh, uh, went to school, I went to school at Central Park Grammar School, uh, Fairfield Grammar School, Inglenook Grammar School, and uh, we moved around a lot. But the last part of my uh, undergrad, uh, High school was with at John Herbert Phillips High School in Birmingham, and I went there for the complete four years. Uh, this was in 1939 when I entered uh, high school, and we uh, had the opportunity to take a course in two different directions. One, if you were going to be into the manual arts. Two, if you were maybe going into college preparatory work. I chose the college preparatory because of the influence of my sister, who was a brain, still is. Uh, and so it was with that background that when the Navy and the Army and the uh, Merchant Marine started coming around to the, the schools in, in 1942, after we had gotten into the war, they were coming around recruiting the guys that were not draft age yet, but had potential that they thought. And they were offering them opportunities to go certain ways in the military. If you want to go into Mercury Marine, you made you could go in to make money. If you uh, went into Army Navy, uh, then it was mainly for the military service. Anyway, I, cho I chose the Navy, and they offered a program uh, whereby they sent you for training at different places and with the possibility of a commission later on. How old were you at the time? At the time that I signed up for this, I was 16, and uh, I had my parents' consent, but they did not induct me into the Navy until uh, I graduated from high school and I was 17 at that time. Okay, good. Uh, but they sent me to two different schools. This first thing, they sent me to Tulane. And I got in uh, roughly a quarter there of both Navy instruction and just being an undergraduate there at Tulane. And uh, from there, they sent me to Emory University here in Atlanta. And I was here for about another quarter. Again, doing this uh, partly military, partly regular school. From there, they sent me to a Northwestern University campus in Chicago. And that was where they had the midshipman school. Uh, I went through the midshipman school, got pretty good grades there. We were commissioned in. 44, and we were given the opportunity to go into, we had we had the opportunity to express a, a, a desire to go in. They sent you, they sent you where they wanted you. But uh, 
I had an aptitude for communications, and so they sent me to the communications school at Harvard, and uh, and I completed that course. And, and by this by this time, the uh, it was evident that the war wasn't going to last as long as uh, originally planned, and so they had all these young officers that they had to do something with besides send them off to sea. So this was during the tail end of the war. So during the see. tail end of World War II. Okay. And so that when I when I finished the communications uh, school at Harvard, they first sent me to several fairly long TDY assignments. I was down in New Orleans, 8th Naval District for a while, uh, just decoding, encrypting, and, and decoding messages coming into the communication center. Uh, other part of the time I was working with the RPIO, that's the Reg Registered Publications Issuing Office, where, where they have codes and ciphers that are renewed periodically. And they didn't send that kind of thing through the mail. What they did was they sent that with couriers. And so I was a courier for a while doing this. And I got to travel around. I, well, I got out to Texas, I got down to Puerto Rico, and some of the places taking registered publications. Uh, and then they detached me from that and sent me to the Panama Sea Frontier in Panama, where I uh, worked on the coding board there and also in operations. Then an opening came open in uh, Honduras up at Navy 509 at uh, Puerto Castillo, Honduras. They operated a, an advanced base where they had fueling facilities. Uh, they could take care of amphibious aircraft. Uh, and they also had a weather station. We also maintained the equipment for the UDT teams, underwater demolition teams, that uh, had the job of exploding all the mines that were drifting down south from up in the Atlantic. And so every once in a while we'd have to take these out, guys out, and they would uh, uh, go into the water with their gear, and we would back off a good ways, and they would swim out, strap on a, a charge, and blow the mine up, and come back. Of course, they got out of the way, they came back and got the but like we say, the war was winding down, and so they decided to close that. We had gotten all the mines out that we knew anything about. And uh, what were the living conditions like in Honduras? Actually, they were great. <laughs> in wartime, you hate to say that, but that it was exactly true. We we went into Honduras and got the facilities of the old United Fruit Company banana plantation there. So it had the big house, it had the, all the outbuildings, it had, uh, it already had many of the facilities that a base would need. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it was just wonderful. I, I, sh I shared a five room house with the, with the, uh, mm -hmm. uh, also in charge of finance and all that sort of thing. Uh, Just the two of you in the five room house. And of course we, of course we had a cook too. <laughs> she, I was going to ask, did you have maid service? She, she came in every day. Yes. Yeah, and and it, it like I say, it was it was it was not like. It was not like wartime. At not all. like wartime at all. Good fishing too, uh, but uh, it, it it was something that. The Navy said we had to have because we did provide a lot of good information for them on weather and all these other things that we, that that red weather was one of my prop, one of my uh, responsibilities. On that base, we only had four officers. Mm -hmm. Only two of us were line officers. There was this, the skipper and me. We, we were the only two line officers. Therefore, I became I became commanding officer of the of the crash boat. Because the skipper had chronic seasickness and he could he didn't go out anywhere, but and then, then we had a doctor and and a uh, uh, supply officer. So you did go out on the the ships? Oh yeah, 
Yeah. What type of ship was it? It was a PC. Uh, actually, we used the PC for the for the uh, demolition people. Uh, we we had other small boats mm -hmm. uh, that only had six or eight men aboard, but we we used those for refueling and that sort of thing. But when that wasn't happening, we used them for fishing, so that, that, mm -hmm. that worked out real good. But I had a lot lot of opportunity to learn a lot of things. I learned how to be a, a storekeeper mm -hmm. because uh, one of my jobs was the ship service, which is the PX of the Navy. Mm -hmm. uh, that was one of my responsibilities. Skipper and I divided those things up. He, he, he mainly uh, worked with working with the civilian populations uh, because we had a little town, Trujillo, right across the bay. We had a little town right outside the gate that grew up just mm -hmm. from providing workers for our base. Uh, How many men were on your base? Less than 40. Oh, it's okay, a very small. Very small. Okay. We, we, actually, we had a huge medical facility. <laughs> The, and, the, and the doctor got an awful lot of good experience there mm -hmm. because uh, when he didn't have anybody that was sick from uh, from the few people we had there, then he brought the civilians in and he treated them. And, mm -hmm. and, and it was a great experience for him. It certainly did the, the people around. It helped the locals quite a bit. Helped the locals and they really appreciated it too because the government of Honduras at that time was just not in any position to mm -hmm. provide any of that sort of thing. But anyway, that that good story came to an end when they decided to close out Navy 509, and they sent me back down to uh, Panama Sea Frontier, where I served on the coding board and, in, and on operations for the rest of my time in the Navy. Uh, I was young, I was still young at that time, and so it took me a lot of longer to build up points to get out than it did a lot of people. Because, let's see, I got out when I was, I guess I was 19 when I got out. 19, yeah. 19. And uh, so, uh, when, when it came time for me to uh, get discharged, they assigned me as the executive officer and the communication officer aboard a small ship going back to New Orleans for going into mothballs. And, uh, that was a hectic trip too. We we left out of Cocosola, headed north up to New Orleans, and we got right opposite the Gulf of Tehuantepec in Mexico, and and that's a, a big cut in the uh, landmass between the United States and South America. It's usually a, the mountain range is almost solid all the way down, except in that Tehuantepec area, and the winds blow through there like crazy. And we were rolling 75 degrees sometimes, and I uh, didn't feel too good for a long part of that period. But anyway, we, we, we went up to New Orleans, and I, I got out of the Navy in, uh, I think it was August of 1946. Uh, then, uh, oh, and my, the girl I'd been going with and dating uh, while I was in Emory, uh, met me in New Orleans with her family, and we got married, and I got out of the Navy the next day. And, <clears throat> and we came back to Atlanta, uh, and I entered uh, University of Georgia, ex I think they called it University of Georgia Extension Center in Atlanta, it's now called Georgia State. Mm -hmm. It was in an old... Uh, parking lot. It was a four or five story parking lot that they chopped up the, uh, the parking garage The parking garage yeah. and made school rooms out of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, what was your field of study? Education. I was going into teaching and uh, but when, when I, I went back into Emory when I, when I first got out of the Navy, I went back to Emory. But then uh, my wife got pregnant. She and her mother decided that my 
and my mother-in-law would get grandchildren. So, uh, but when she became pregnant, I knew I couldn't make it on the GI Bill and the little stipend we were getting from them. And so, and and besides that, they wouldn't let people with children out there in, the, in that housing thing where we were. And uh, so anyway, I started looking for a job, and uh, well, a lot of jobs open, a lot of business booming. Uh, but when they asked me what I planned to do, and I told them I planned to teach, well, no one wanted to hire me because they were looking for permanent people. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I got kind of discouraged. I went down to the Dean of Men and uh, told them what I, I, that I needed a job. And they, they said, what kind of skills do you have? And, uh, and I said, hey, I can type. Because in the, in the Navy, all of the crypto machines, they had a normal, almost normal keyboard for mm -hmm. typewriter. And so, and they said, I guess it's no sweat. They got lots and lots of applications that are desire for people that can type. And say, so they handed me the list and the phone numbers. First one on there was American Red Cross. And uh, so I called them and they said, had, got an interview, went down, they hired me. And uh, so uh, I was in school there for, uh, until 1940, let's see. So you were working with American Red Cross while going to school? Is while going right? to school. I, I was working, I, I handled the robot typing machines. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever heard of a robot typing machine that's living today, I don't think. But what, they, what it was was a manual typewriter that sits down in this little well with a little wire attached to each one of the, to the keys. Mm -hmm. And it, and then you typed out, you typed a thing like a piano roll. Do you remember what a piano roll was? Big wide with a sheet of paper. You punch the holes in it. You punch these things in there and uh, the machine after that would type that letter over and over and over again. And so this was our answer to that. And did you complete your schoolwork? I got to the point where uh, I was eligible for a teaching certificate. I, I didn't. I didn't finish college. I didn't finish the thing. But the schools were hurting for people, and so I could get a a, a job teaching school down in Moultrie, Georgia, as a matter of fact. And I, I did that after we got through with this the spring quarter at Georgia uh, University of Georgia. And so I went down to uh, the personnel at Red Cross and told them, you know, that I was going to be leaving in uh, the midsummer or so because I was going to teach school. And they said, gee, well, we're sorry about that. And so I got a call from the deputy director of the Red Cross down there. And he said, hey, Guy said, you ever think about staying with the Red Cross? I said, well, I don't, I'm going to do something better than this. He says, well, I'm talking about going back and working with the military. And uh, I, I had known a little bit about that from just reading stuff in the Red, in the Red, around the Red Cross. And, uh, and I said, well, but I, I know from just the applications I've seen that you've got to be at least 35 years old to get a job doing that. He said, well, we're setting up a new program to see if we can't get some of the younger people uh, in uh, to counsel with the military people who we work with. I said, well, my, my first question was, how much does it pay? Of course. <laughs> because I knew what the school was sure. going to pay. Mm -hmm. And this was about 35 or so dollars a month more than the school system, and I said, well, I'll try it for a year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, 
I've tried it for almost 40 years. <laughs> uh, they sent me to Benning uh, for some training. To where? To Fort Benning. Oh, okay. Uh, for some training with an old time Red Cross director that had been working down there for a number of years. And he had a training course that he had me study. And then he came around and checked on me every once in a while. But uh, I enjoyed the work. It was, it was, uh, and still is, uh, the job of helping the young soldiers uh, adjust to life in the army uh, because they're leaving, they're leaving home. Uh, they have problems back home. That they don't know how to deal with them, but, uh, and so. Red Cross, as a non-military organization, non-military in the sense that we don't have any authority over them, or that, that, that uh, we can influence anything that happens to them. But they could come in to feel free to discuss anything they wanted to with us because they knew it wasn't going any further than that, unless they wanted it to go. And uh, I enjoyed I enjoyed that concept of counseling. Did your family move with you to Fort Benning? Uh, not right away, mm -hmm. uh, because during this training period, it wasn't certain that I was going to remain at Benning after I completed that, so the family stayed in Atlanta. Uh, <clears throat> they, they did come down later, but uh, let's see. So after your training, where did you go? Okay. Actually, I stayed at Benny. <laughs> oh, okay. And then uh, Operation Portraits was announced. At Benning was the 3rd Infantry Division. Was it Benning? Or at least the headquarters of the 3rd was there. Uh, they had two of the regiments there and one regiment up in, in Fort Devens, Massachusetts. Uh, to, but they were going to have the first big Army and Navy Air Force operation coming after World War II. They had the first jet aircraft uh, mm -hmm. to use in that. And they were using a lot of new concepts. And uh, so <clears throat> when the Army asked for Red Cross to accompany them on this thing, my boss down at Fort Benning, uh, said, how would you like to go? And I said, well, I thought I'd like that. So we went up to a base up in North Carolina somewhere. Mm -hmm. And we staged out of there with our troops, with the Marine Engineer Boat and Shore Regiment, with their Air Force, so that we all could get down there at approximately the same time. But we were going to be fighting. This was going to be a little war. And we were going to fight the, the uh, 65th RCT, Red Regimental Combat Team. So it was a training exercise. It was a training exercise. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we uploaded off of uh, this out in North Carolina as a troop ship. Everybody had the same gear. I had the same packs and all this other stuff that everybody else had. In addition, I had my typewriter and my, and my bag full of forms and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we got on this troop ship. It was the Bear County, B-E-X-A-R County, out of Bear County in mm -hmm. Texas, as a matter of fact. And uh, they didn't know where to put me. Since, since, so they, they had me travel with the chaplain and the doctors. So, oh, okay. so uh, we were on this one ship, and we also had a lot of troops on there. And oddly enough, we took our first casualty getting off the ship uh, because these ships had high, high uh, freeboard, and so. 
So what they did was they throw this big net over the side of it and you climb down the net into a waiting boat down below. And you climb down with all these packs and stuff on you. Uh, which you're trained to do back at, back at uh, your, your normal duty station. But this young lieutenant, oddly enough he was an Indian, a Navajo or something. Uh, he was climbing down, or he got on the net and started down. Had his rifle strapped across the back of his uh, mm -hmm. And as he was going down the net, he fell, and that, uh, he fell on his back, and it broke the rifle, and it stuck him and killed him. That was the only death we had in the whole exercise. We had a lot of injuries, mm -hmm. because we had the 504th and 505th airborne units out of Fort Bragg that dropped in there. And that was a, it, the DZ down there was not sort of plush, and it didn't have good thick grass. And so that we took a lot of casualties down there on landing. They, they don't do that anymore. They land standing, Where did you go standing to? up. Yeah. We, we were on a little tie island of Yekas. Oh, off, in the Puerto Rico. In Puerto, off of Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and but that that was great training for me too, because it gave me uh, a chance to see what working out in the field with troops was like, mm -hmm. and the problems that come up. Communication was. Sporadic. We, we got our messages in, our, our emergency messages for guys, because even in that situation, if an emergency comes up at home and we know about it, uh, we can get the word to the military and, and they will cut orders on him and send him back. Mm -hmm. It usually involves, uh, well, down down there, it could be death in the immediate family, the illness, uh, serious illness in the immediate family. Some, and for some, family problems too that uh, couldn't wait till we got through the exercise. Mm -hmm. They would let them return. And then of course the guys had situations where they're not getting mail from home and that sort of thing. So we had, we sent, for the whole time I was in Red Cross, uh, a great part of ours was just keeping families in touch with each other. We called them health and welfare messages. And how long were you working with this particular group? Uh, Actually, we, we came back I, I, about three about three and a half months mm -hmm. on, on this exercise. We, we came back uh, from that, I think it was in April of, uh, of 1950. And uh, we just got unpacked. It took, takes a while to unpack. Mm -hmm. and, uh, when the North Koreans came across the border in uh, in Korea and invaded the South, uh, within and that let's see that was June that was June the 28th I think 1950. Uh, the word came out almost immediately that we were going the Third Infantry was going to go. Uh, that and one other one other outfit out of Texas. And of course, there was a couple of there was a division or two already out in the Pacific. So the 24th, I think, was still out there. So uh, when they got the word, then the G1, the, the guy in charge of personnel for the whole division, uh, uh, he went to my boss and said, "Well, can can guy go with us on, on this too?" And so uh, he posed the question. And I told him, yeah, I'd go. So anyway, uh, uh, then, then there was the problem of relocating the family. I brought them back to Atlanta. Uh, her mother was happy to have them there since she could baby the grandchildren. And uh, so I, I went with, uh, I didn't go, I didn't, go over in the same trains or anything from here. But what <clears throat> what happened was that they cut orders on me for the Far East, the, the Department of Army here, 
they cut orders on me. And I went through Japan and then joined them down in Jumanji, in, in, uh, in uh, the South Island of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, we were down there, we went through some training. I need to back up a little bit. There, there, was, there was some difficulty with this maneuver showed us we had difficulty. We were undermanned. Of course, this was post World War II. The army had drawn down, uh, so that all units were short. They were short-handed. Uh, so at Benning, where we had two regiments, we took the 15th and the 30th, and in effect combined them into one unit. We had the seventh up at Devons, and. Uh, that had this floating regiment down in Puerto Rico. So what they did was they they beefed up the seventh, combined the uh, two here, and took the 65th from Puerto Rico. Actually, they sent the 65th from Puerto Rico directly over because they were in full strength. That was one the only, only full strength regiment, I think, it, because there was an awful lot of people in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. could make more money in the army and they couldn't work in out and about. So uh, they sent them in and they attached them to somebody over there. I'm, I'm not real sure who they attached the 65th to uh, because the 65th got into Korea before we did. But uh, after we got into Jumanji and sorted ourselves out a little bit, the Korean government sent us several thousand brand new bodies most of these were just Korean youngsters that uh, had never seen a gun uh, and couldn't speak any English. Of course, our guys didn't speak any Korean. They had few interpreters, and we just had all kinds of problems over there. But we had to take these things in just to have enough bodies to carry the rifles that needed to be carried in there and get them. In other words, getting that many boots on the ground. And uh, the, uh, uh, there's some horrible, horror, horror stories about what went on in Japan because they didn't like our food. Our food made them sick. The Koreans didn't yeah. like it though? Yeah. The food made them sick. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, uh, they were disciplined for taking the food that we would provide them here, taking it down and trading it to the Japanese for rice and for the things that they had used. I don't know what I, I I'm not going to tell that story. Mm -hmm. there, there was one horror story that, mm -hmm. that was, it's just too bad because uh, it changed the whole idea that the, that the Americans in our unit had for the Koreans, and because it involved the way the Koreans treat their own people. Mm -hmm. and, and that was nice. So how long were you at this location? Uh, about two months, I guess. And then <clears throat> we went and offloaded uh, in, it was in, uh, I guess it was in October of 50 that we uh, got on ships at Kokura and we made a landing at Wonsan, which is in North Korea, uh, up just below him, home and home mm -hmm. And then we turned north from there. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your uh, duty title? I was, I was the assistant field director uh, for the American Red Cross assigned to the 7th Infantry Regiment. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a life member of the 7th Regiment uh, organization. Mm -hmm. I, in fact, I got a big thing from them yesterday. Uh, but uh, it, the division was made up 
of three regiments plus uh, the division headquarters and all the attached stuff like armored units and artillery units and that sort of thing. But for the infantry part of it, uh, you had three regiments. So yeah. you were assigned, attached to the unit? I was attached you to, moved to the unit? with was, the unit? Everywhere they went, I went. Okay. I, I ate out of the same mess hall. Uh, mm -hmm. They provided communication services to me so that I could communicate with the Red Cross offices back in the United States. Because for every problem that we knew about in Korea or anywhere on the military installation, everywhere the installation, installation was, for every problem we had, a similar problem was handled by a local Red Cross office back in the United States somewhere. Mm -hmm. Because, for instance, if this guy was concerned because he hadn't heard from his wife, or what concerned about he hadn't heard that she had a baby or something, you know, that sort of thing, they were just worried. So they would come to me and I would send a message back to the Red Cross in the United States nearest to where this family lived, mm -hmm. and they would go out and check with them, get the information, put it in the message, and send it back to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that the communication the communication speed was not great back though. But first of all, this is the first time they ever, had ever done anything. Uh, the people in the army then were not the same people that had been in the army during World War II and had undergone uh, you know training and had problems that they had to. Uh, work on. Uh, and so we all, we had to learn it again. We had, had, had to learn everything almost new again. And the military, the military had changed some of, some of their, uh, concepts about people. For instance, when, when we got to Korea and a guy's mother died, today, if that happened today in, in, in Iraq, he would be home on the next plane. Mm -hmm. Over there, sometimes we didn't get the message for two days. And he certainly couldn't get out of there in two days or three days or even may, maybe couldn't get out for a month. Forget any trans transportation back. So what the Department of the Army decided was that if it involved a death, then there would be no emergency leave. Uh, only if the situation was such that a doctor could say that they expected the person to die within 30 days did they give emergency leave for illnesses. And again, it was it was strictly for the immediate members of the family. That's your mother, father, sister, brother, wife, or children. Or somebody that uh, took the place of a parent during your childhood. Uh, so it was your job to work on behalf of the serviceman yes. with the Army? With the Army. Okay. They did have one, they had one thing I thought was pretty smart though. The Army in Washington, D.C. set up a thing in the, in the Pentagon there. They had an office that made judgment calls on all this stuff before we ever got the message. What happened was the Red Cross locally, like Atlanta, mm -hmm. if, if you had a son in the Army and, and your wife got sick and you wanted to try to get him home, then the Red Cross would, first of all, would verify all the stuff with your wife's doctor and get, get that out of the way. And they would incorporate this in a message of request for leave, send it to our office in Washington. We literally took those requests over in baskets to an AG, uh, adjunct general section in Washington. And they made decisions right there on whether or not emergency leave was going to be granted. If it was, then the Army would send a message to the command 
authorizing this man to come home if he wanted to. We, in the meantime, uh, the Red Cross in Washington sent us a message to tell him us what the uh, problem was and whether or not emergency leave had been approved. Mm -hmm. If it was, then we would go out and tell the man uh, and ask him if he wanted to go home. Oddly enough, some of them didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an odd reaction. Mm -hmm. But uh, So how long were you in North Korea? Did you move down to South Korea? Yes, we did. We okay. got kicked out. Mm -hmm. in, after we brought the Marines out of the Chosen Reservoir area. Mm -hmm. I don't know that the Marines don't admit it. <laughs> but but the 3rd Battalion of the 7th, Marine, 7th Regiment walked the ridges for the Marines to get out of the Chosen Reservoir. Uh, I met some Marines later in my life that confirmed. Anyway, uh, what, what was I saying? We were talking about uh, moving from South Korea, from oh, yeah. North Korea to South yeah, Korea. Okay. Uh, after, after, after the Chinese came in, mm -hmm. the Chinese were the deciding factor because we had the North Koreans on the run. Mm -hmm. Because we had gone fast. The, uh, mm -hmm. uh, So anyway, when, when the when the Chinese hit us, we were we were we were in bad shape anyway, because it, the weather over there had been so bad. It, it was 30 below lots of times, and we only we only had summer gear because the reason the Third Infantry was so prepared back at Fort Benning when this happened was that we were planning a, a, a transfer to Europe, and so. They hadn't drawn mm -hmm. all that winter equipment and everything. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, they thought when, when we went when we went over there that we would have this knocked out in about a month or a month and a half, mm -hmm. and then we would just go straight from there on to Europe. But you're gonna have to move along because okay. we're running out of time. Oh God, I didn't, yeah. I didn't have got a foot in yet. But but anyway, uh, we we the Chinese forced us out of North Korea. We left there in December of 50, uh, left it burning, not, not the city, our goods, but we couldn't get out of there. I, I left uh, North Korea on the Hunter Victory, sleeping on 500 tons of ammunition, and that was the only way we could get out of there. But anyway, uh, went down, and we went down to Busan. Uh, we got our supplies, we got resupplied, we got lots of new personnel because in the meantime they had been drafting people and so we had people over there, the reserves and the, and the uh, National Guard had been called up. And lots of unhappy people, guys that had been operating their business uh, a week before were now in Korea trying to figure out which end of the gun was the thing to shoot out of. But uh, uh, so then we uh, after after we got geared up, we started going northwest out of Korea because the, the Chinese had moved down south of Seoul. It pushed all the refugees down into the south. We went up, we went across the Han River at uh, Seoul, and then for the next six or seven months, we fought up and down that, that valley going that goes north from Seoul up into the, mm -hmm. the north section. Mm -hmm. The way you say we is if you were really a part of the I fighting was. military. I was. Were you in danger of being shot? <laughs> Often. Often? <laughs> well, um, I mean, you know, uh, if you're w with a unit as small as a regiment, you, you know, you can't. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can not so even in combat situations, you were right there with the unit. Well, and when 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 we were when we were uh, making contacts during the fighting. Now I, I I didn't go into this, you know, blindly. 
I didn't just go say I'm gonna go up and see so and so. Uh, but I would go by I would go by and check with G three, which is the people that know what situation we're in right now. And if I got a message in that this guy was having a family problem back in Podunk, Michigan, then uh, I'd go to G three, find out where he was, mm -hmm. and uh, get my driver and we'd get our little thing and we'd go out there. And so that's as far forward as you can get. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, we, we were on one of those little missions and we got some got some fire the day that I Okay. The uh, the tides of war over in Korea were Involved fighting back and forth up through this corridor north of Seoul. And there were beginning to be talks in the UN, United Nations, about some sort of settlement for Korea. They, uh, they finally started to try to define a demarcation line of, of separation of the two Koreas. And so during during this time, the fighting was still going on, but it was beginning to go down. The intensity was going down, and they would fight for just short periods. So uh, by this time, I've been over there about a year, a little over a year. So my time came, so I rotated back to the United States for assignment back at Benning. I did training at Benning, training new people in Red Cross for a short period of time. Got promoted, went to Fort Stewart, uh, was pulled out to go with Operation Sagebrush, which was uh, mostly airborne. They were testing new, new tactics, uh, taking people up in helicopter, taking up the front in helicopters, inserting them and extracting them uh, when they had their uh, situation covered. Uh, after that, I went down to Puerto Rico. They asked for a new opening of a base down there. I went down and set up an office there and established relationships with the military, the civilians, and with yeah, some of the islands over in the uh, Caribbean because uh, Red Cross in its disaster function uh, had a lot of contact with the Caribbean uh, countries. After, uh, after that, I came back to the United States and and was assigned to the space center at down at, uh, in Florida down at uh, Cape Canaveral. I was there for a year, and during this time, we drew blood for all the uh, astronauts. Just before they fly off, we would draw a full blood supply for them in case it was a problem. The correct type and cross matched and everything. And, so uh, your job there was different from what it was with the military. Well, uh, this was the Air Force Base. At, oh, okay. This was Patrick Air Force Base mm -hmm. in, in Florida, and that's where I was assigned. Was Patrick mm -hmm. Air Force Base. Uh, the uh, the only time that they had a tragedy down there. They didn't, the blood was of no value to them because all three of the astronauts were killed right on the, on the uh, in the vehicle as it sat on the ground. Mm -hmm. But one, one, one thing about it, the astronauts were really nice to the Red Cross and the volunteers that gave blood and, and did all the other things for them. Uh, that they would sign their blood card. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Each 
each one of them, of course, had a different blood type, they would sign the cards for them. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I, was the, I was there just a little over a year. And then I got an opportunity for the one assignment I had been waiting for for as long as I worked for Red Cross, and that was an assignment to Europe. And we were assigned to Nuremberg, Germany. Uh, got to take the family over with us. Uh, we uh, uh, lived like normal human beings over there for for a long for uh, three and a half years. The, uh, the 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 main event, I guess, of the European tour was <clears throat> the invasion by the Russians of Czechoslovakia in 1958, I think it was 58, they invaded Czechoslovakia, and, and all the Americans, all the, all the foreigners in uh, Czechoslovakia at that time tried to get out immediately before the Russians took over, and so there was a convoy that came out of Prague coming into Germany, and, and it just happened that it was in our sector. And so we're the ones that went down and met them at the border. The, uh, they got out of there with only the clothes on their back and maybe whatever they could, one bag they could throw into something that they could put on one of these trucks that came out in this convoy. Uh, the, the most notable member of that convoy was Shirley Temple Black, who happened to be in Prague at a meeting. She, she was a, an ambassador to one, one of the, the African countries. Uh, but she was uh, in Prague for a meeting. Which, but she came out with this group. And uh, all these people, when they came in, our military intelligence people, of course, des descended on this group as they came in because they wanted to debrief them about what was going on over there. And, uh, what they saw. So who, I, a friend of mine had Ms. Black to, as an interviewee, and uh, they put him in little rooms, and they didn't come out for, it usually took about 10 minutes of max with one person. 30 minutes later, they, this door, door hadn't opened, and our commander unit, uh, our the area commander was getting upset. Finally, the thing came out, and I asked Chris, I said, what the heck, what the heck's y'all been doing in there for this period of time? And he says, guy, he says, I got everything out of her in five minutes that I needed to know. He said, but that woman just <laughs> won't stop talking. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, but that, 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 that was a frantic time. People came out of there. Again, like I say, with no money and no and basic clothing is all. And uh, but within but within a week, we had we had them pretty well shaped up. Red, Red Cross was used to uh, transmit money back and forth. Uh, we we put them we with our high school over there was a area high school, so that we had students that came in there and lived on the base during the week and then uh, during the uh, weekend they would go to their home at some other base 50, 60 miles away. What base was this in Nuremberg? This was at uh, North Bavaria District Headquarters in Nuremberg. It was in downtown Nuremberg? No, it was out, uh, actually it was at, uh, isn't that terrible? What not? An army base? It, it, it was an army, it, it was a Darby Concern, Darby Concern out there. Mm -hmm. By the way, I went by there and saw that uh, about a year and a half ago, flat, mm -hmm. nothing there. But uh, they kept the children from coming in to the school for a week to let the refugees use their uh, rooms. And we took over the army hotel. 
the first night we were in, I, I raided the uh, PX and the commissary and got necessities for the women and the babies and all of other stuff. And mm -hmm. Our volunteers over there were just great. Uh, they were all Army dependents, mm -hmm. and uh, they really helped out. But anyway, that, that was the most exciting thing that happened in Germany. Uh, I guess the most next most exciting thing, though, was that it was during this time that Korea, I mean, that Vietnam had been going on for about a year. And so the people that, the Red Cross people that had gone to Vietnam with their units uh, were getting ready to be replaced. Uh, and so the, this team was going through asking if there was anybody that wanted to volunteer for direct assignment to, to Vietnam. And I, I knew my time was getting close, and so uh, I volunteered. It took me about 45 days to get everything packed up and the car shipped and the kids shipped and get to Atlanta, uh, where I bought a house, uh, bought another car, uh, and got, and I was, Within 45 days, I was in Vietnam and uh, went in with the 25th Division up at uh, Kuchi. And uh, I spent a year, well, a little longer than a year. And the reason it was a little longer than a year was that uh, about two weeks before I was due to leave, there was one of the Red Cross girls was killed in, in Vietnam. She was murdered one night uh, in the woman's compound. We, we, we have a compound there for the ladies. There's a barbed wire all over it and all this kind of stuff. But uh, uh, somehow somebody got in there and killed this lady. Beautiful little girl from here in Georgia, as a matter of fact. Uh, they, I stayed around. First of all, my headquarters thought I ought to stick around anyway just to see how things were going. And so I stayed there about an extra month, but they could not find any uh, hard evidence against anybody. Now I heard later, about a year or so later, they did try somebody over there, but I talked to a man that, that uh, a Red Cross saw that had gone in there as an observer at the trial, and he said, he couldn't have convicted that man, uh, or, so they, ne they never found out who killed mm -hmm. But uh, anyway, that, that was a hard time. The work there, different different kind of war. You didn't have the up and down fighting like you had in Korea. You didn't have that trench warfare like you had in Europe uh, during World War II and that sort of thing. Uh, this was war from a main base and they they had what they called hard spots out in the delta area where we were. And because you had water around a lot of it. And so you'd find something that was a foot above water level and you'd build a little base on it. But sometimes you only manned it during the daytime. At nighttime you pull in somewhere else. Uh, it's strange. And you did all your travel all your tactical travel by helicopter. Very few roads. Uh, are we getting close? Yeah, go ahead. But, uh, so, but the, the work, the work was not more difficult because you had better guidelines on the military's part. Uh, and you had better facilities for people so they could go out and get recreation, like you had R&R to, to Hawaii if you want to meet your wife there, or you had headed to Japan or Okinawa or Australia or wherever you wanted to go. Uh, and so when I, I got out of there in uh, 19, <laughs> uh, let me think. Uh, Lord. 
1960 something. Oh, God, in that term. You have senior moments. Seven years ago. 